Aging has long been considered an inevitable part of life, a natural decline in function that we all must face. However, recent advances in science suggest otherwise. Aging can be viewed as a disease, one that can be slowed or even reversed. We will explore groundbreaking insights into the science of aging and discover practical strategies that anyone can implement to extend health and lifespan. Why we age and how to slow or reverse the effects of aging. Aging is not the normal and natural consequence that we all will suffer, but rather that aging is a disease that can be slowed or halted. You're going to learn a tremendous amount of information and you're going to learn both the mechanistic science behind reversing the aging process and practical tools that you can apply in your everyday life. Any of us, indeed all of us, can slow or reverse the effects of aging. Why is it that having elevated blood sugar, glucose, and insulin ages us more quickly? And or why is it that having periods of time each day or perhaps longer can extend our lifespan? Well, let's start with, with what I think was a big mistake, was the idea that people should never be hungry. We live in a world now where there's at least three meals a day. So the feeling of hunger, almost, some people never experience hunger in their whole lives. It's really, really bad for them. What we actually found, my colleagues and I, uh, across this field of longevity, is that when you look at, first of all, animals, whether it's a dog or a mouse or a monkey, the ones that live the longest, by far 30% longer and stay healthy, are the ones that don't eat all the time. My lab and others showed that there are longevity genes in the body that come on and protect us from aging and disease. The group of genes that I work on are called sirtuins, there's seven of them. And we showed in 2005 uh, in a science paper that if you have low levels of insulin and another molecule called insulin-like growth factor, those low levels turn on the longevity genes. One of them that's really important is called SIRT1. And, but by having high levels of insulin all day, being fed, means your longevity genes are not switched on. So you're falling apart, your epigenome, your information that keeps your cells functioning over time just degrades quicker. Your, your clock is ticking faster by always being fed. The other thing that I think might be happening by always having food around is that it's not allowing the cell to have periods of rest and, and reestablish the epigenome. And so it also is accelerating in that direction. So hunger, of course, is associated with low blood glucose and low insulin. Do you think there's anything about the subjective experience of hunger itself that could be beneficial for longevity? Yeah, I, I do, though you get used to the feeling of not eating, so I'm kind of screwed that way. It's like cold water, you eventually adapt. You, you get used to it, unfortunately. But there, there are some studies that are being done at the National Institutes of Health that are able to simulate the effect of hunger but still provide the calories. And it's looking like there's a, a small component that's due to hunger. But most of it actually is because you've got this, these periods of not being fed and then the body turns on these defensive genes. There's a really interesting experiment that was published maybe a couple of years ago by Rafael de Carbo down at the NIH. What he did was he took over 10,000 mice and gave them different combinations of fat, carbohydrate, protein. And he was trying to figure out what was the best combination. And then he also cleverly had a group, well, two groups, one that was fed all the time, or ate as much as they wanted. And the other group was only given food for an hour a day. And it turns out they ate roughly the same amount of calories. Because of course, in an hour, they're stuffing their faces. It turns out it didn't matter what diet he gave them. It was only the group that ate within that window that lived longer and dramatically longer. So my conclusion is, and mice are very similar to us metabolically. I think that tells us that it's not as important what you eat, it's when you eat during the day. I would say definitely try to skip a meal a day. That's the best thing. Does it matter which meal or are they essentially equivalent? Well, as long as it's at the end or the beginning of the day, because then you, you add that to the sleep period where you're hopefully not eating. I think that that's an excellent point. I realize it's a, it's a simple one, but I think it's an excellent one because I think one of the things that people struggle with the most is knowing when and how to initiate this so-called intermittent fasting. And the middle of the day obviously is not tacked to the sleep cycle in the same way. So it's much harder uh, as well for many people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what I do. Um, I, I skip breakfast. I have a tiny bit of yogurt or olive oil because the supplements I have need to be dissolved in it. And then I go throughout the whole day as I'm doing right now here with this, this glass of water here. I'm just keeping myself filled with liquids and so I don't feel hungry. Beware that the first two to three weeks when you try that, you will feel hungry. And you also have a habit of wanting to chew on something. There's a lot of physical parts to it. But try to make it through the first three weeks and do without breakfast or do without dinner and I, you'll get through it. And I did that most 
for most of my life, actually, mainly because I didn't, I wasn't hungry in the morning. Some people are very hungry in the morning and they may want to consider skipping dinner instead. But I will go throughout the whole day. I don't get the crashes of the high glucose and the low glucose that anyone who goes, oh man, it's three o'clock, I'm going to need to sleep. If you do what I do, you, you will not experience that anymore. Because what my body does is it's, it regulates blood sugar levels naturally. My liver is putting out glucose when it needs to, and it's very steady and gives me pure focus throughout the day. And I don't have to even have to think about lunch. I'm just powering through. At dinner, I, mean, I love food as much as anybody. So I will, I will eat a regular, pretty healthy meal. I'll eat, I'll try to eat mostly vegetables. I can eat some fish, some shrimp. I rarely will eat a, a steak. I mean, that's the other thing. What, what works for me may not be perfect for you. And we do have to measure things to know what's working. I rarely eat dessert. I gave up dessert and sugar in my when I turned 40. I avoid sugar, which includes uh, simple carbohydrates, bread, I try to avoid. I've actually noticed, this is a, a just a side note, I used to get build up of plaque pretty easily. Uh, and every time I went to the dentist, they'd have to scrape it off. And I even bought tools to scrape it off because it was driving me nuts. I don't get plaque anymore. And I think it's because of my diet. I don't have those sugars in my mouth that the bacteria feed on and then form the biofilm on the teeth. Do you ever do longer fasts, like 48 hours or 72 hours or week long fasts? Occasionally I do. So my typical day, I, I would only eat within a two hour window. Just usually I'm eating, either eating out or. So you're 22 too. Yeah. And if you exercise, do you feel like you, then you just power through and maintain that fasted state? Absolutely. I can exercise and now my body's so used to it. I don't feel like I need food after exercising. I used to. Um, and But have I gone longer? Yes, but not very often. I find it qu quite difficult to go more than 24 hours. Uh, but when I do it, maybe it's once a month, I'll go for two days. After two, and actually even better if you go for three days without eating, it kicks in even greater longevity benefits. So there's a system called the autophagy system, which digests old and misfolded proteins in the body. And there's a natural cleansing that happens when you're hungry. Macro autophagy, its name is. But a good friend of mine, uh, Anna Maria Cuervo at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, discovered a, a deep cleanse called the chaperone mediated autophagy, which kicks in day two, day three, which really gets rid of the, the, the deep proteins. And she, what excites me is she just put out a, a big paper that said, if you trigger this process in an, in an old mouse, it lives 35% longer. So it, it's a big deal. What are the things that anyone and everyone can do, should do to live longer, basically? I think most people don't appreciate is that exercise isn't just beneficial for your fitness and for your vitality. It actually can stop diseases in their tracks. Um, exercise can slow down cancer. In fact, it can prevent up to 23% of all cancers from occurring. Um, that's true for cardiovascular disease. In fact, it has an even bigger effect on that. 30% reduction just by doing moderate exercise every week. 50 minutes is, is sufficient or three times a week with 10 minutes. All cause mortality, right? So what we are, all cause mortality is, based, mortality is basically slowing down aging. That's a 27% reduction in the rate of aging just by exercising. I think we all know that we shouldn't smoke because it's very likely that we'll die earlier if we smoke. Smoking is approximately a 40% increase in the risk of ACM. And what does that translate to? And that means I'm I'm shortening my life by 40%? No, it means at any point in time, there's a 40% great, greater risk that you're gonna die relative to a non-smoker and Got a it. never smoker. Got yeah, it. yeah. so it's important to distinguish. It doesn't mean your lifespan is gonna be 40% less. It means at any point in time standing there, your risk of death is 40% higher. High blood pressure, it's about a 20 to 25% increase in all-cause mortality. Um, you take something really extreme like end-stage kidney disease. So these are patients that are on dialysis waiting for a, a, an organ. And again, there's a confounder there because there's what's the underlying condition that leads you to that? It's, you know, profound hypertension, you know, significant type two diabetes that's been uncontrolled. You know, that's enormous. That's about 175% increase in ACM. So now the question is like, how do you improve? So what are the things that improve those? So now here we do this by comparing low to high achievers and other metrics. So if you look at low muscle mass versus high muscle mass, what is the improvement? And it's pretty significant, it's about 3x. So if you compare low muscle mass people to high muscle mass people as they age, the low muscle mass people have about a 3x hazard ratio or 200% increase in all cause mortality. Now, if you look at the data more carefully, you realize that it's probably less the muscle mass fully doing that and it's more the high association with strength and when you start to tease out strength you can realize that strength could be probably three and a half x as a hazard ratio meaning about 250 percent greater risk if you have low strength to high strength if you look at 
cardiorespiratory fitness, it's even more profound. So um, if you look at people who are in the bottom 25% for their age and sex in terms of VO2 max, and you compare them to the people that are just at the 50th to 75th percentile, you're talking about a 2x difference roughly in, um, in, in, in the risk of ACM. If you compare the bottom 25% to the top 2.5%. So you're talking about, you know, bottom quarter to the elite for a given age, you're talking about 5x, wow. 400% difference in all cause mortality. That's probably the single strongest association I've seen for any modifiable behavior. If you do the right things during your life and start at an early age, let's say 25, start eating the kind of diets that I talked about. I think that we should all aim to at least reach a century. I'm a little bit behind. I was born too early to benefit the most from all of this discovery. Those of you who are in your 20s, you should definitely aim to reach 100. I don't see why not. Consider this, this is really important. The average lifespan of a human that looks after themselves and but doesn't pay attention is about 80, okay? Japan, that's the average age for a male, a bit higher. If you do the right things in your life, which is uh, eat healthy food, don't overeat, don't become obese, do a bit of exercise, get good sleep and don't stress, that gives you on average 14 extra years. That gets you to 94. So getting to 100, if you just focus on what I'm talking about, it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. So what's the maximum? Well, we know that one human made it to 122 and a number of them make it into their teens. I think that's also the next level of, of where we can get to with the types of technologies that I'm talking about. How long can we ultimately live? Well, there's no maximum limit to human lifespan. Why can a whale live 300 years, but we cannot?